Subscribe to The Honest Critique for current affairs, movie, book, and product reviews. Also, make sure you press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the video series are solely those of the individuals and do not necessarily represent those of The Honest Critique and its employees. The following video contains strong language which may be offensive to some viewers. Viewer discretion advised. Hello and welcome. Today we have among us David Patnaik. David Patnaik is a best-selling author, mythologist, podcaster, radio host, YouTuber, and an illustrator. He has got an impressive CV, doesn't he? Uh, David is out with his new book, Pilgrim Nation, and unfortunately, due to the pandemic, I have only soft copy. Okay, David has a hard copy and he's showing it to us. But fortunately, I could travel to this pilgrim or uh, all these places without even actually moving because of this book. So thank you, David, for actually writing this book and making our pandemic lives a little bit better. Namaste, Honest Critique. Hi, Ratnadeep. Hi, Muskan. Nice to hear from you. Uh, so tell me how to proceed. We'll go with each question. Hi. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, so just moving into the first question, uh, Devdat, I'd just really like to ask you that uh, why do you refer to Bharatvarsh as a pilgrim nation? And uh, why did you choose Shavan Kumar in the cover? Like, um, what was your motivation behind that? So, Muskan, uh... You know, uh, Bharatvarsh is the old name of India. It came, comes from uh, Bharat clan. And Bharat has different meanings in the Hindu world, in the Jain world. In the Vedic world, it is the person who sort of compiled uh, the Rig Ved. Um, now, I decided to use this word because everybody keeps using this word about India being Bharat, India being Bharat. And it's not very clear uh, you know, why, you know, when you look at this thing, you know, it's called Pilgrim Nation and it's called the making of Bharatvarsh. Bharatvarsh, what does it mean? And nowadays it has become a very uh, sensitive topic. That is the original name of India. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we know each other? Do we know each other from names that others gave us? So Hindustan is a name which outsiders gave us. India is a name that outsiders gave us. The local people came up with the name called Bharatvarsh, based on a great king. Either he was a Jain king, the son of Rishabh Nath or Rishabh Dev, or he was the son of, uh, um, you know, what's his name? I forgot his name. Uh, the Indian king, Shakuntala and Dushyant son, the Bharat. Then there is an, uh, the Bharatas or the tribal kings which come from the Rigved and associated with the composition of Rigved. So that's what I thought I had to draw attention to the people of this, how Indians know uh, their land. As far as the Shravan Kumar is covered, so you can see this image of Shravan Kumar. Now he's traveling, you know, it was, it reminded me of the Kavad Yatra in North India. Lots of young men travel and it's rather a, um, you know, aggressive young men in North India travel to Ganga with a coward and the coward they carry these pots of water to collect Ganga and take it back home and they don't keep the coward on the floor. So I wanted people to be reminded of that but to remind that the original coward carrying person was Shravan Kumar and in India traveling, uh, going on pilgrimages is a very big thing. Taking parents on a pilgrimage is very important. So pilgrim nation, uh, nation of sons who want to take their parents across uh, all pilgrim sites before they die. An idea which is a very ancient one, clearly, because it is there in the Buddhist Jataka, Shyama Jataka, it is there also in the Hindu uh, tradition, the Ramayana, again, over 2000 years ago. So these ideas are ancient ones and I wanted people to be uh, drawn to it. Traditionally, in India, a holy spot was associated with a water body, a Tirtha, usually a pond or a confluence of two rivers or a bend of a river with a flight of stairs, a ghat, or a ford, the shallow part of a river where one can walk across to the bank, right? But as it come from the Vedic age to the present, sex, present day section of your book, we find that a lot has changed over the years, especially with the access to this place of workshop and more democratization of such institutions. Uh, what do you have to say about that? 
is it true that we have changed a lot and so we we look at pilgrim places or uh, if you could just have about holy places how has it changed over the years so ratnadeep uh, yes uh, traditionally india was known as a holy spot you know the whole idea of water was very important so uh, so Ratnadeep, I can see that you have seen the book in its detail and you know that I have taken 33 pilgrim spots and I have distributed, although they are geographical locations, I distribute them over history of history of India. And you're right, as you move from place to place, as you move over time across geography, you realize that the concept of Tirtha has changed. It is no longer a pond, but you know, any temple in India needs water. So there'll always be a pond associated with it. Small pond, big pond, step wells of Gujarat, the ponds, the great uh, ponds of Tamil Nadu. So this will never go. It is always there. So uh, uh, what happens is the holy land, while there is you know rocks and river, the water, the spot of water is always going to be important. Um, and, because Indians know the value of water. We are a land which is based on the monsoon rains and therefore uh, anything which collects water, whether it's a river, whether it's a rainwater harvesting kind of, that is the reason why these things were built. Uh, so it's not just natural phenomena, not just natural ponds, but also artificial ponds. So I think Indians always knew the value of water and therefore even though we are not directly associating the new temples with water, every temple has a water pond. Uh, some of them have dried up over time so tragically we don't have those ponds anymore but ponds remain water remains an important point um, of uh, worship so uh, you know during chat puja they go to water forms uh, you know even in polluted waters they'll stand and worship so water is something that we can't you know bathing in the water ganga water bathing is still remains important part so i don't think it has changed over time so just, you know, moving on, since uh, both Ratandeep and I, we're from Bengal. So let us just take the liberty of asking you a question on uh, Rani Rashmuni. So from the construction of the Dakineshwar temple to defy the rules of gender, caste, class, religion at that time, especially. So tell us how she inspired a generation through her work so uh Mus you're right this raja uh, rani roshamuni uh, remarkable woman. i didn't know much about her so dakshineshwar kali is associated with her and uh, you know I, I i when i read about her i was impressed like she was obviously a very intelligent woman she took business she was doing trade she was dealing with uh, you know, the Bhadralok culture, the men, she's a widow, so she's treated differently by the men. She is, uh, obviously caste is an issue. Uh, you see how she talks to the Brahmins, how she manages the Brahmins. She, obviously, gender is an issue. Uh, the fact that she's rich and powerful, women are, not, men are not used to taking, uh, you know, instructions from rich and powerful women. But India has had a long tradition of female rulers. And I think whenever we have this mother goddess figure on top, we sort of, sort of somehow fall in love with that image. But the she deal with the British, and then she does a statue. Uh, she wants to build a temple in a city which already has a temple. You already have Kaligat temple. I, my first question is, why would you bring Dakshineshwar Kali if you already have a Kaligat temple? One. Two. Why do you take land which is related to crematorium? <coughs> and from what we know, it was related to burial grounds of the Christians and the Muslims. So clearly, and the Kali temple is being built. And the image of the Kali she chooses is one which is walking on top of Shiva, uh, Dakshineshwar. So it is local, but I get a feeling it's, you know, you can see a kind of a subversive feminism coming inside it. Um, how you use the Brahmins to get them to consecrate the temple. Then you have Ramakrishna Paramansa working over there. So in a way, the entire Ramakrishna tradition, she sees something in him, obviously. Uh, so the whole thing about uh, uh, her work and, you know, this whole idea, that is a time when India, uh, you know, the, it's roughly around uh, the... 1857 uprising and this is the time when the idea of the nation state is emerging this is the roughly approximately the time when the first image of Bharat Mata is being created although it is Bongo Mata it's not Bharat Mata and the image is today even there in Bengal even today done by I think Adityanath uh, Avindranath uh, Tagore if I'm not mistaken just to refer to the book sometimes I keep forgetting these names but uh, 
the whole idea of Bharat Mata comes at that time. Then you have Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, who is the you know, proto-nationalist at that time. Again, they're all writing really for Bengal. They're not writing for the whole of India. The idea of India is just emerging. And the Bengal sort of inspires that idea. Bharat Mata is an idea. And then, of course, these strange ideas start emerging. The Kali, because she doesn't wear clothes, is India stripped of its wealth by the British. And Durga, with all her glory, is... Uh, what we are supposed to be. So these ideas are emerging. The Bengal Renaissance is taking place. Raja Ram Mohan Roy is coming up with the word Hinduism in 1816. In 1894, Chandranath Basu is coming up with the word Hindutva. So you don't realize all these words, Bharat Mata, Hindutva, Hinduism, all these three come from Bengal. And Rani Rashwani uh, is from that period. Uh, she comes from this very, uh, and that is the time when the Bengal was extremely rich. We cannot believe that anymore. Today when you go to Bengal, you see what the communism has done to the state, how we're trying to get back to the glory. You see what's happening in Bangladesh. Bangladesh is resurging and dipping into its old models. Uh, the, the genius, the local genius, which was always there in the, uh, in the, Bengali lands, and I hope this will happen to the rest of the country. We have to see this uh, Rani Roshamani and the Dakshineshwar temple and you know that is the temple where Ramakrishna Mission uh, started in a way because Vivekananda was a student. So we, all that, whether it's Raja Ram Mohan Roy, whether it is Chandranath Basu, whether it is uh, Vivekananda, we can all trace it back to this one remarkable woman who has built this remarkable temple which stands there today, even today and it's like a place you go to him. And you see the Shiva, uh, Shivalinga in front of the goddess. Uh, it's, a, it, it's a thing, it's to be noticed, and built by a single woman. You know, it's very different from the temples uh, you find anywhere else in the country. So I think that's, uh, there are not many, a lot many Kali temples. And this kind of a, uh, it's not like a Kaligat temple, which is an old ancient temple. This is a new temple designed with a purpose. Uh, and unlike the Birla temples, where the name Birla is there right in front, even before the god's name, which is not a really a Hindu tradition, but very popular. The Birla family decided to do that. Normally, you always take the deity's name. And therefore, you don't have, to, it's not called the Rani Roshamoni temple. It is called... Uh, the Kali temple. So that was, uh, you know, so the whole point of pilgrim nation is when you go to a pilgrim spot, it's not just going to the deity, but understanding the geography, the history, the rituals, the symbols, all that has to be done. Okay. Uh, a million dollar question, probably for all the people who have read your book. Why do you consider Taj Mahal as a pilgrim place? What's the distinction between a pilgrim place and a tourist place for, like, a tourist place? What makes a tourist place probably, I'll let me just raise and say, what makes a tourist place a pilgrim place? And what's your take on the recent Tejo Mahal conspiracy that was going on? So, uh, Taj Mahal, I decided to call it a pilgrim spot because you see tourists when they come to India, they all go to see Taj Mahal. And this annoys Hindutva a lot because all photographs of India is associated with a Muslim tomb because that's what uh, Taj Mahal is. You know, many people think Mahal means a palace and we think Taj Mahal is a palace, but it actually is a tomb where two dead bodies are there, one of Mumtaz Mahal and the second of the great Shah Jahan, who is buried next to his wife, not for romantic reasons, only because his son wanted to save money. And this beautiful, beautiful statue is made and that has become the image of India, which annoys the Hindu lobby, which wants a Hindu temple there. Naturally, they'll say this really is originally Indian, Tejo, Mahale, uh, you know, it's like, you know, many people believe California uh, is Hindu because it is really Kapila Aranya. You have, I don't know if you've heard that. Or Australia is Astrale because that is where Pandavas had kept all their Astras. So these kind of weird ideas come all the time and people strongly believe it. Of course, they've used Hindu craftsmen because that's the craftsmen that are available. If you go to Goa, for example, the Goa temples look like churches. Why do they look like churches? It's because the craftsmen who built the churches were also building the temples. And therefore, it was just easier that way. And when the Muslims came to India, they brought their architects with them, but they also used the local artisans. So it's a lot of Hindu Buddhists. But look at the structure. It's, if you look at it from a aerial point of view, you'll see the design of the gardens around it is very much designed around Islamic principles, not based on the mandalas at all. It is definitely not radially symmetrical. Uh, it does not have the mandapa. There's nothing looking at it. But then you can't say that it's a true arch. But you can't tell people, you know, you 
can wake up a person who is asleep. You cannot wake up a person who is pretending to be asleep. So don't bother to explain to Hindus. They have their own fantasy land. They believe Aryans left India. You have genetic evidence, linguistic evidence, archaeological evidence telling you that you know 3500 years ago in 1500 BCE, the Aryans came to India. They brought a language which evolved eventually into Sanskrit in India, of course. But all these data, they don't care. They want to believe that like, you know, non-resident Indians, the Aryans left India and went abroad, which sort of justifies why many of these Hindutva people give up Indian passport and go to America. You can't explain to them. The Taj Mahal for me is a pilgrimage because the idea of pilgrimage is uh, about uh, discovering a land, discovering a people. Many people see this as a romantic. Husband and wife go there as, a, as if it is going to a shrine of love. It's a shrine of love for many people. It's nothing to do with religion. It's nothing to do with Shah Jahan and Mumtaz Mahal. For the husband and wife, it is a shrine of love. Uh, but it also, but it is also important to remember that it's very strange because it reminds us that in India, the burials and burial sites are not considered to be holy. And uh, pilgrim sites, except unless it's a sadhu or Mahatma, uh, like Mahatma Gandhi's, where he's cremated, is a holy site suddenly, a secular holy site. But in traditional Indian, uh, you know, the body is burnt and the bones are thrown in the river. There's no trace kept. But these practices are changing. So I wanted the people, the Taj Mahal essay, to draw attention to tourism and its close relation with pilgrim nation. And, uh, you know, in Hawaii, India, and it's a destination tourism, right? It's not just to enjoy the weather. You go to Agra, it's a dirty, miserably dirty city. But you go there because you want to experience this, this uh, monument of love. And you, when you're there, you start feeling alone. You wish your wife was with you, your husband was with you, boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever. Uh, you know, when Princess Diana came, she got herself photographed alone. She wore a very cleverly red and blue dress so that she's photographed alone. And by being photographed alone, she's she was demonstrating to the world that her marriage was falling apart. So I thought that is important. And like we all know about Sabrimala and like this controversy around the entry for all and like the equality of all religious traditions. So Mushkan, uh, this Sabrimala thing, the uh, controversy. Now, Hindu temples are based on certain principles. Hinduism is based on diversity. Islam is based on equality. Diversity and equality never align with each other. It's something that people just don't understand. Diversity is about difference. And equality is about removal of all difference. So, in an equal world, I don't see you are different. I see we are all this. And this idea is there in Islam. We are all equal in, in front of God. And therefore, everybody, if you see, if you go to a uh, Jama Masjid, Everybody uh, performs rituals exactly in the same way. All the men uh, bow in the same way. The women bow in the same way. It is done five times a day. It's, a kind of, it's all about homogeneity, uniformity, standardization. These are the words that come to you when you think of Islam, when you think of Christianity to a degree. Uh, but the, you know, nature is designed around diversity and human culture tries to move towards uh, homogeneity or equality. So equality and homogeneity are very close to each other. But when we think of Hinduism, we think of hierarchy. We don't think of diversity. Wherever there is diversity, there will be hierarchy. So there is always going to be. Because in a diverse world, you will say, that, okay, I like this, I don't like this. And therefore, Hindu temples are built keeping this diversity in mind. So there are temples where only women do some pujas. There are temples where only men do pujas. Different castes do pujas. There are different caste temples. So these temples were designed around a different social structure. Sure. India has changed. Since then, we are like, we are now believe in equality. We don't value diversity so much. We want everybody to speak Hindi. We want everybody to speak English. We want everybody to be on Facebook. We want everybody to be on Aadhaar. We want everybody to be... And, and therefore, this uh, Shabrimala temple was traditionally not used. There are many temples in India where women are not allowed. And there are many temples where men are not allowed. There are many, many rituals in India where men are not allowed. Just as in Islam or in Christianity, you don't see a female Pope, not yet. All those people are screaming and shouting, why are there no female popes? The muezzin who shouts, for, you know, the azan is always male, they're a female. Prayers are not led in Islam by female. So this gender has been a global issue. Now, so just to see the Shabrimala temple, the Ayappa temples, most Ayappa temples around the India, there are many Ayappa temples. First of all, Ayappa is a Malayali shrine, it's a Kerala temple, it's a Kerala culture. Most North Indians have never heard of this shrine. 
So it's not a Hindu temple. It is a local temple. So it's a local expression of Hinduism. And there are many Ayapa temples. Like in Bombay, there are many Ayapa temples where all genders go. There is not an issue. It's this particular shrine that there has been some kind of a rules that have been followed for a long time. You know, 100 years ago, nobody went to this temple. Today it's a major pilgrim site and now there are these rules. So these rules will change just as they've changed over time. But this kind of a legal intervention is what irritates a lot of people. The court cannot, you know, the court starts to interfere only in Hindu matters but not in Christian and Islamic matters. It is seen uh, by especially the Hindutva as persecution of Hindus. So these are political matters. I don't think it's a matter of faith. I don't think anybody is thinking that by going to Shabrimala and letting women, Indian Hindu is going to get any better or misogyny is going to come to an end. So, you know, in Kerala, there are churches where women are not allowed to uh, enter in certain rituals. So, there are many such things. The gender thing is a very big thing. Shabrimala is more politics than about faith. So, and most people who comment on Shabrimala or Hinduism or Hindu temples don't understand these how these temples were constructed. Uh-huh. There is a purpose these temples were constructed. Good or right or wrong, I don't know. But they were constructed around div- diversity, gender diversity, caste diversity, whether we like it or not. Hinduism is a casteist religion. We would not like it to be casteist. Now we would like uh, you know, everybody to enter the temple, but everybody will not be a priest. It will come from the Brahmin communities. Unless we change rules, then you will again. The fact is you are not giving up your caste. So how to decide a temple? Not all Brah- tem- priests are Brahmin. Brahmins, by the way. There are many temples in India where there are special. They are known as movers in Maharashtra, for example. There are Doityapatis in Odisha. They are not Brahmins. But who do? how do you explain these complexities? You, a Tamilian can't come to Odisha and tell that tomorrow I want to be part of the Puri temple rituals as part of equality. Won't be allowed. They will say that, no, this is for hundreds of years. It's been managed by these 1500 families. And the priests will only come from these families. You can call it nepotism. So these are complex issues. These are, I mean, how much do you value tradition at all? Does tradition matter? And all things in tradition is not good. So they will die over time. You know, we carry forward things that we like and some things we will not like. And as people change over time, the rituals will change, the temples will change and they have to change. They have no choice. But you don't, if you try to force it through legal measures, then sometimes it works. You know, you have to, like Gandhi had to do major activities to get people to enter temples. 100 years ago, many people were not allowed to enter temples. Today they are, so the world has changed. Not completely, there are still places where Dalits are treated extremely badly. In South India, there are places where Dalits are not even allowed a burial ground. So, the problems persist. They are not gone away just because the constitution doesn't uh, forbids it or something. So, these things take time. So, uh, Nathan, as you were uh, answering the previous question, let me ask you about what's more important uh, in a pilgrim place? Is it the cultural aspect uh, among amalgates with the historical importance of the place or the religious importance? Uh, which is more important? Uh, which lens should we look at the place with? So, Raktadeep, um, whenever you go on a holiday, you, have to, you go there for a good time. Like Some people like the historical parts of it. Some people like the spiritual parts of it. Some people like the cultural parts of it. Some people just get out there to have a to enjoy themselves. Sometimes it's nature. Like when you go to Badrinath or Kedarnath, it's the mountains around it. So it's a little bit of everything for everyone. Everybody chooses. I would like to know the history and the geography of it. Not everyone does. When I go to Tirupati, I would like to know when was the temple built, who built it, how I was it built, what were the rituals being conducted, why are the rituals of Tirupati different from the rituals of Jagannath Puri? Why was Tirupati become famous in the later part of the Vijayanagar Empire, especially after the Battle of Talkota? So these kind of questions is what excites me. It doesn't excite everyone else. Some people just want to go and do darshan and leave the place. Some people want to go to Tirupati for the food. Some people want to enjoy the long experience of standing in a long queue. Some people because they want to see the seven hills. So let everybody has a choice of different things. We just have to keep adding different flavors. Uh, for me, Pilgrim you know, is the original tourism industry. Uh, you know, there were merchants who travelled, there were pilgrims who travelled. That's it. That's the original travel industry. And we've often seen you make this comparison between like Hinduism and Hindutva in your tweets. And Hindutva is considered to be like a subset or at times like a political ideology. Uh, for our audience, could you just explain to them a little bit more about the difference between the two and like where it actually stems from? 
So Hinduism and Hindutva. So first of all, the words uh, Muskan, these both these words, as I said, have come from Bengal. In 1816, uh, Raja Ramahan Roy officially uses the word Hindutva. Officially, name, but first document that we have Hindutva. There are some records by others, foreigners also, uh, Jesuit priests, right, using the word Hinduism. But Raja Ramahan Roy is associated with Hinduism. 1816, early part of the 19th century. 1824, Chandranath Banerjee uses the word Hindutva. Now, what is the context? Raja Raman Roy wants to reform Hinduism. He wants to change Hinduism. What about uh, Chandranath Basu? He rejects these uh, reforms. He thinks these reforms are making fun of Hinduism, Hindu practices, because all reform involves getting rid of something which is bad, which means criticizing. You criticize sati, you criticize female infanticide, you criticize denial of female education, you uh, criticize caste system, uh, and all that, child marriage. So Chandranath Basu says, enough of this criticism of Hinduism. Nothing is wrong with Hinduism. Hindu, there's a logic behind everything. And that's how the word Hindutva emerges. Veer Savarkar, uh, you know, he gave, called himself, remember, Mr. Savarkar called himself Veer. He used the word enough because everybody calls him Veer. And uh, unlike other people, he wrote in 1923 the book about who is a Hindu and used Hindutva to explain the people who believe that India is their holy land are Hindus. Now, there's a very clever way of saying that because Christians think Jerusalem is the holy land and Muslims think Makkah is the holy land, they are not Hindus because they don't consider Bharat. Bharatvarsh to be Punya Bhumi. It's only a residence for them. So in many ways you can say that American, you know, all the Indians who have traveled to America and are holding the passport over there and saying, your Punya Bhumi is India. So your heart is in India, you know, like that uh, Jataka tales where the monkey leaves his heart behind on the Jambu tree. So these kind of clever political games are played. So Hindutva is nothing to do with Atma Gyan, nothing to do with wisdom. It has nothing to do with the glory of India. It has nothing to do with Dharma, Artha, Kama, Moksha. It is only about power. And that's what you see today everywhere. It's proof of the pudding is in the last six years. We are seeing that there is the, there is no economic growth, there is no defense of our country, uh, the health uh, people are, uh, there are more people for, uh, starving, the hunger index we have gone, more people are hungry in India today than they were six years ago. So everything has collapsed in our country despite promises like digital India. So Hindutva is not interested, they are not interested in anything but power and politics. So you know, at the practical level, Hindutva is only about power and politics. It is about uh, imagining that there is a wound and it's a very monotheistic uh, it's like India has been hurt by the Muslims and you have destroyed the Muslims that's all Hindutva is all about and it is about uh, not about uh, it's about you know you, Hindi is equal to the national language I mean come on have you ever read Bengali literature Odia literature Marathi literature or trying to unite India by one goddess Bharat Mata who suddenly disappears or posters where Ram is shown without Sita Krishna is seen without Radha Shiva is shown without Shakti where the leader is one leader who takes all the decisions there is no collaboration happening very different from Hinduism nothing Hinduism about it Hinduism is, Hinduism is diversity uh, Hinduism is about organicness. Hinduism is about changing things, allowing localization. The gods in every city are different. The gods in every village are different. Rulers and governance structures are very different. So Hinduism is about diversity, about dynamism, about complexity. Hindutva is about singularity, master strokes and politics. Very different. Uh, very, very different. And like since Hindutva, it follows a linear Western template, just like Marxism, secularism, liberalism. Can we conclude that it is a form of a political ideology? Like, what are your views on it? Yes, Muskan, we can say that, uh, uh, you know, Marxism also comes, from, you know, uh, Marxism is trying to make the world a better place. And it ends up creating Mao, Setung, Stalin, Pol Pot, who killed billions of people. Uh, Marxism, you know, Marx was an anti-Semite. I don't know if you know that. He was an anti-Semite. He, he was born a Jew, but he'd converted to Lutheran. Uh, his family converted to Christianity. And uh, he was, he hated his Jewish heritage. And since the Jewish people were businessmen, he came up, you know, some people will argue that his entire hatred for Judaism led to the Marxist doctrine. So, uh, it doesn't come from a happy place. It doesn't come from making the world a better place, but it comes from some other place. And same thing is about Hindutva. When you try to save the world, when people want to save the world, I'm very, very wary of this. You know, for me, uh, pilgrim nation, you know, pilgrimages, you have, you know, Ram Janmabhumi is being created. Is it being created to create faith in people or it's created for a political identity? Um, you know, it, 
does a, you know it's a very beautiful grand temple but it reminds me of a Swaminarayan temple or a Jain Mandir it's very modern and obviously there's somebody who hopes that instead of going to Taj Mahal people will start going to Ram Janmagami temple um, it's a temple where the goddess is not seen anywhere and all the priests seem to be celibate men yogis and RSS volunteers there's nothing Shubha Mangala over there so it is a political, I don't think anybody denies the fact that Hindutva is a political identity. The thing is, Hindutva starts imagining itself as Hindu dharma. That's, we can't say anything about it. So you can't argue with Hindutva because they will attack you. They will get the trolls after you. They will bother you with income tax rates. So we just allow Hindutva to do whatever it wants with the country. We just have to go through it because we voted them. Like many, uh, at least... 30 to 40 percent of India voted for them, not just upper caste subordinates, but many, many uh, lower caste people also voted for them. And we are going to face this. This is our karma. We, ye beej boya hai. So, whatever we have sown, we are going to reap the harvest of it in a way, one can say. And we didn't expect this harvest. Like, as Krishna said, phal ki chinta mat karo. And this was one phal we never expected to come. So, a chedin with lower economy, starving people, but everybody in denial also. We live with it. Can an idea like secularism flourish in a religious place, which is more of a private space? Can we be secular when we are religious at the same time? Uh, secularism is about allowing everybody to celebrate their religion, respecting each other. It is not about denial of religion. Unfortunately, in our country, Upper caste Hindu uh, have been embarrassed by them because of caste, you know, because we are all privileged, we are all elite, we have benefited from the caste system. So we are so ashamed of ourselves that the only way we prove that we are secular is by making fun of Hinduism. And that has annoyed a lot of people. It is one of the reasons why many people have turned to Hindutva because there is no political party which celebrates Hinduism. You see, Congress doesn't celebrate Hinduism, although Rahul Gandhi will occasionally say that I'm Shiv Bhakta or something like that. We want people to celebrate Hinduism and Islam. You know, you can't have, uh, every day in Bombay, for example, you have the Azam playing loudly. And, you know, it, it's very annoying. It's a noise pollution issue. It's not a religious issue. And I know many of my friends who are Muslims, who are also liberals and activists, saying that this noise pollution is not necessary. We have given religion to uneducated mullahs. We have given in India, in Hinduism, we have given it to uneducated, these mass mobs people. You know, we have to respect each other, right? Noise pollution is important. You know, if you want to, during Holi, can we have organic stuff? During Ganpati, can we have more organic stuff? Because now we are celebrating these festivals at an industrial phase. It is not criticism of Hinduism. It is about improving Hinduism, expanding with time space. So I feel that secularism will only happen when we celebrate our religions and celebrate Indianness with each other. Not this mock, uh, mock uh, respect for each other, but genuine respect for each other. Where I don't put loudspeaker because my neighbors are irritated. I don't uh, indulge in chemicals that destroy the ecosystem. So I think that is what we done. I need I need a political party which celebrates Indian culture, not be embarrassed of it, right? And that's the problem. Secularism is embarrassed of Indian culture. It's trying to become something else. And that nobody likes it. This deracinated form of some Marxist ideology or socialist ideology. Economics is good, but people want to celebrate their culture. It's our identity. And I don't see that. Just wearing a kurta doesn't make you Indian. I think you should enjoy being Indian. You should celebrate India. With, uh, and I don't see that in politicians. They only give it lip service. So secularism in the current form, definitely not. It needs a different redefinition, realignment. So a controversial question, but like a common point of hate towards like another community is because of what happened with the temples during the Islamic rule and like their destruction. So how much of that anger is really justified? And how can we as a generation move away from like this past division because of events that happened like... Uh, Anger is for foolish people. You know, everything in society, culture is based on the exploitation of nature. Culture, all wonderful things in culture are born of oppression. For example, the pyramids were built by 
forced labor. People had to give their services to the king as a form of tax. So the pyramids would not have been built without exploitation. The temples would not have been built without exploitation. No art exists without exploitation. So oppression, exploitation is going to be part of society. We keep managing it. We keep repairing it. We keep uh, uh, regulating it and controlling these things. It's all it's not going to happen. And you see what has happened is we you have this justice discourse. What is justice? Justice is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So everybody talks of social discourse, social justice. So when Dalits say that we have been oppressed for centuries, the blacks say we have been oppressed for centuries, so we have to, we want our, now the, the thing is now we want justice. It really sounds like revenge, our time. And therefore, there's a pushback. The pushback by the whites, pushback by the Savarnas. When the women speak like that, then the men uh, go against them. Then when the homosexuals and queer people and transgender speak about it, then the cisgender people. The... So there is a confrontation. You can't create the... this justice discourse is a, a European and Christian and Islamic discourse, which is continuously looks at the past as evil. So Islam, the past is jahil. For the social reformer, the past is barbaric. And we want to improve it. We want to civilize ourselves. So these are concepts which are very, very Western in their structure. And uh, it's not based on collaboration. It has not been moving on because you cannot repair the past. You can never repair the past completely. What you do is like, you know, you have a dal in your house which has become salty. What do you do? You don't throw the dal away. You don't say salt. The dal is evil. We have to create fresh dal. What you do is you keep adding water to it and changing the consistency till the taste becomes palatable. In the same way, every society will have oppressors and oppressed. There will never be a society with an oppressors or oppressors. Will you spend your entire world only punishing the oppressors? Because, especially oppressors. Uh, you know, so these are very difficult questions that nobody wants to answer. You know, justice is, I will punish you for your crime. But social justice is, I will punish you for your father's crime. And nobody asks these difficult questions, you know. You know, you'll have policies which say that, okay, your grandfather benefited from this, so today you will not benefit from it. Now, I'm going to say, no, I want to, how dare you deny me my things because your, you have not benefited over generations. And these are difficult questions to answer. And at the end of the day, it will not be solved logically. There will be a little bit of force. There will be a little bit of violence on both sides. And then the fault lines shift here and there, but they don't go away. So if anybody thinks that we can create a policy by which we will punish all white people and we will punish all Savarnas and we will punish all men and we will punish all heterosexuals and we will punish all cisgendered people, they are living in a fantasy land. Because you can only create conflict and that's what the world we are seeing. We are seeing a great pushback by people who are like sick and tired of do-gooders. And we have to reflect on it and redefine and create a new uh, model of thinking. And I think that's what is happening today in the world. You know, I think I hope the Pilgrim Nation will help people take a journey through history and geography and figure out answers that are not so simplistic like we'll remove the oppressor and solve the problem. You know, Durga Puja happens and people keep thinking that I have heard people who have said Durga is the feminist leader. I have heard people saying Durga represents uh, Savarana patriarchy. Now, who is right? Okay, thank you so much, Devdut, uh, for joining us on the episode. It's a pleasure talking to you and getting to know so much about uh, the places uh, that a lot of our, even our Prime Minister has been vocally saying this over the last few years, that to go local and to visit local tourist places, to go to the pilgrim places, actually. So great to know and learn about these places in detail from you. Thank you so much. I know you have been a really, uh, you have been really busy throughout this week, and thank you so much for making your time. Uh, hoping to see you soon, and uh, take care. Thank you, thank you, Ratnadi. Thank you, Muskan. Thank you for this opportunity, and I hope your uh, viewers do buy this book, Pilgrim Nation. The Making of Bharat Varsh by Aleph. It's available on Flipkart and Amazon. Even during COVID times, where you cannot travel you can make a journey through history and geography across the holy sites of India. Not just Hindu holy sites, but also Christian and Muslim and secular holy sites. And uh, enjoy the greatness of India and celebrate it in all its forms. Hey, hold on. Before you move on to the next part of the video, let me tell you something. It's very interesting. Days of Patnaik books are on a limited time price or a limited time offer price. Uh, it's available on sale right now on Amazon. So if you are a person who loves mythology, this is the right chance for you to grab them at a limited time deal. Go and grab your copies right now.